Welcome to the Faith and Belief Forum podcast. We work towards a society with strong interfaith relations where difference is celebrated. Join us as we delve into questions of faith, belief, identity and more with fascinating guests from diverse communities and organisations across society. My name is Tim and today we are talking about how faith and belief intersect with the broader idea of social cohesion. Um, So the Faith and Belief Forum together with the British Academy have a new report coming out which is called Cohesive Societies, Faith and Belief and everyone on the call today has been a massive part in making that happen. So we've got Dr Madeleine Pennington, we've got Professor Tarek Madud and we've got Dr Mariam Mahmood uh, with me today. I guess that's probably the last time I'll use their full titles Um, uh, but really really pleased to have you all with us. I'm going to let you all introduce yourself um, individually but it would be great if you could include a little bit about maybe your own faith, belief and identity and also how you're involved in this project. So I can kick off. My name's Tim Mortimer. I'm a programs manager here at the Faith and Belief Forum, which is the largest interfaith charity in the UK. Um, I grew up in the United Reformed Church, which is a fairly small Christian denomination, but I would sort of describe myself somewhere between Christian and agnostic these days. Um, And in terms of this project, I was involved in early conversations about the need for this report and then also sat on the steering group. Uh, I'm Madi. I wrote the report uh, and I am head of research at Theos Think Tank, so we were commissioned to write it. Uh, my own faith background is that I am a Quaker. Um, I was raised a Quaker and an Anglican, so I have one parent of each. Um, so I suppose I'm, a, as they say, a Quanglican, but um, I worship the Quakers. And um, yeah, that's me. Tarek? I'm a member of the British Academy and um, I'm on the steering group of of this project which comes out of the British Academy Cohesive Societies programme. My um, background is that I was brought up as a Muslim in in London uh, and I went to, um, well it was the secondary modern school but in those days, this is the 1960s, um, religion was actually quite a, 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 a clear feature of the school timetable and school activities. Um, it was a kind of non-denominational Christianity, but um, with my father's support, who was a devout Muslim, he asked me to participate in all the activities, but just remembering that it wasn't true that Jesus was the son of God. And so I did. I uh, read the lesson in morning assembly. I uh, organized the school choir at Christmas. So if you like, I I have that uh, background of school Christianity. And of course, um, as I, you know, grew up and through all my adult life and so on, I've been very engaged with all kinds of uh, secular philosophies and humanistic points of views and so on. So I, I, I think my background is a quite uh, broad spectrum of faith and belief. Hi everyone. Um, yes, so my name is Maria Mahmoud and I am the Centre Facilitator at the Calvary Centre for the Public Understanding of Religion in my day job. So my faith background is I am a practicing Muslim um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I grew up in Ireland. So. Much of my experience, I think Tarek and I had this conversation once before, so I always crack this joke, that um, growing up in Ireland in the late 90s, early noughties, um, I went to a Catholic school, went to a convent, and, um, you know, when people ask you that question, where are you from? Or, you know, what are you, is rather the question. So, no, so what exactly are you? And you go, well, you know, I'm a Muslim. And then you say your ethnic background or whatever, and they're like, no, no, no are you, we, we get that you're a Muslim, but are you a Catholic Muslim or a Protestant Muslim? Now that's, that's the point of concern. So um, I always like to add that caveat that um, Catholic Muslim, I guess, given the, uh, the, the convent upbringing. Um, besides that, um, I am currently in my day job, I'm um, the centre facilitator at the Cadbury Centre for Public Understanding of Religion. And um, as a means of trade, I am a researcher, academic, who is very much engaged with 
um, religious and racial stereotyping of individuals and how we react to that in our daily lives. Um, for this project, I was alongside Tarek, I was um, one of the members of the steering committee, had um, a lot of um, good times, you know, going over this incredible and pertinent and timely report that we're going to discuss now. I don't want to spend too long on this part because I really want to get into a bit more of a substantial discussion about um, the really juicy parts of the report, but I thought that we could attempt to sort of quickly between us explain how we've got to this stage of um, producing a report together um, through talking to each person. I thought first, Tarek, if I could ask you to just briefly explain what the Cohesive Societies programme at the British Academy is all about. Yes, the Cohesive Societies programme at the British Academy is a few years old and it, it's about looking at um, how cohesive societies um, work, how they maintain themselves, um, how they change over time and adapt to difficult circumstances. And the purpose is to try and uh, bring in all the different disciplines of the British Academy, including, you know, history and literature, and of course the social sciences. My own background is in sociology. Um, we had a, uh, a couple of very general reports published last year, very good reports, literature reviews, and pointing out, as it were, the state of the art in policy terms, as well as uh, theoretical terms. One thing we uh, noticed was how little religion featured, religion and faith featured in those reports in any kind of positive way. It did feature, but it featured as a problem to be solved by policymakers and uh, state agencies and so on. And so we thought, well, no, that's not good enough. We need to take this a bit further. And so together with yourselves at Faith and Belief Forum, we wanted to commission a report, which is now published. And I think uh, uh, Madeline's done a very good job. Congratulations, Madeline. Um, which showed what uh, faith and belief has to offer to uh, society's cohesion in different ways at different uh, levels and not just be identified as a problem or policy concern. Then I hand over to Maddie to speak a little bit about what's in the report. Sure, so um, the report is in two halves. And the first half um, really deals with the sort of policy landscape that Tarek has um, outlined. So basically, faith is a problem, sort of essentially looking at the period from the start of the 21st century onwards with, with a little bit more framing than that, and seeing how often um, policy interventions are in response to crises, um, which was um, in the first instance race riots and then um, terrorist attacks. Um, obviously, those are problems which need solving, but, but they are... Um, not seeing cohesion as an end in itself, and they have also closed down various aspects of um, the faith contribution to our cohesive societies in various other ways. So um, the first half outlines that, and then the second half looks at um, trying to establish a more nuanced or spread um, narrative of the, um, the impact of faith on social cohesion along the five core themes of the cohesive societies. Um, series, which are meanings, see if I can remember them, <laughs> meanings, of me meanings and mechanisms of social cohesion, um, cultural memory and tradition, identity and belonging, um, social economy and care for the future. So in each of those, it, it looks at essentially um, the fuller range of what faith offers and has some practical examples as well. Finally, um, Mariam, maybe you could say a little bit about the steering group for this project. So, um, as we mentioned earlier, I was part of the steering committee, steering group um, of this project, alongside some very eminent scholars. Obviously, Professor Tarek Madud was part of the, the committee, um, of, of the steering committee. Um, alongside us uh, was Professor Douglas Davies, who is Professor of Theology and a Fellow of the British Academy. So he's a Professor of Theology at the University of Durham and uh, Dr. Jasjeet Singh, who is at the University of Leeds and is specialist on race and religion. Um, so, you know, and, and obviously we had 
the wonderful Tim steering all the meetings and uh, Phil, who is the director of the Faith and Belief Forum, putting this report together. We, we did background work in the sense that, you know, um, we, we mulled over these ideas. We thought about what can we do differently? Because uh, as Tarek's already mentioned, that there's so many reports out there, but the, the intricate role of faith, you know, as a cohesive entity itself, when we discuss cohesion, is often missing. So I think um, we, we can discuss that perhaps in, in more detail now, but um, that's what we did. We, we'd come together and um, kind of think about what we can do differently. I think Marianne's suggestion is a good one. So I think we'll move on to asking ourselves first a broad question. So I'm interested to hear why you got involved in this project and um, why particularly you think that is examining the intersection of faith and social cohesion is an important thing to do. So um, I got into, involved in this because Theos has been working in um, the impacts of churches on social cohesion specifically for the last um, year and a half for something called the Free Churches Commission. So um, we were looking across the country at practical examples there. And I think um, what really struck me in all of that was um, sort of f firstly how much positive work is actually going on and how that just isn't reflected in policy. And I think that is obviously something that in the very structure of this report comes out very clearly. Um, but also how fundamental social cohesion actually is and, and how people just completely fail to understand what it is and why it matters. It just sounds like council speak and most people. So we asked all of our participants in that project, um, what do you think it means? And so many people were like, actually, I had to Google it before I said yes to this interview. Or, oh, I wasn't quite sure. Or, you know, slightly eye rolling kind of, oh, it's just the local authority, isn't it? But, but actually it's, it's relationships, it's what we hold most precious and, and we don't really have the kind of poetic language, I don't think, or, it, or if we do it's too poetic almost to describe what is really the heart of the issue here and, and I think faith contributes something there which, um, you know, for many of us who have a faith um, identity, or I guess we all have faith identities of some kind, but, but, but that, that completely captures what it is to care about social cohesion as well and I think that those two things often align in ways which is just it's sadly missing from the conversation when it's just you know instead talking about crises and um, as Tarek said a problem to be solved. I, I entered uh, racial equality pos policy work and, and before that uh, community relations and anti-racist activism and so on in the 1980s and I was kind of surprised and discomforted by the fact that religion and faith identities, faith communities, were seen to be in some ways irrelevant to racial equality, or worse, that they were some kind of divisive presence that had to be constrained and kind of kept out of the room. And I when I moved from policy work into academia and um, studied and started contributing to theories of multiculturalism, I had exactly the same experience again, that the leading authors of multiculturalism, you know, substantial theorists, they were talking about everything but religion. So, you know, ethnicities, indigeneity, various other kinds of uh, features of minority, of course, you know, uh, race and racism, um, and I felt this just isn't isn't right. So having you know, as I said earlier, being brought up as a Muslim and knowing how important Muslim identity is to Muslims in Britain and for that matter, just about anywhere else, much more than um, race and colour, and often much more than issues around you know nationality and ethnicity. I thought that we needed a much more composite, multi-layered understanding of race and ethnicity in which religion featured, and especially when religion, and in particular Islamophobia, began to take off. I really thought we needed an understanding of faith communities, both then as an object of racism, which wasn't happening before because racism was understood as just a kind of a color thing, but also faith communities in terms of their own 
sense of being and their own sensibility and identities. And that, from those days onwards, that's been a very important feature of my theorizing and writing. So when I had the opportunity to, to get involved in uh, this steering group and this project and so on, um, it naturally built, built on the things that I'm interested in. Well, I was, uh, I got involved with this project um, after you'd kindly asked me, Tim, to, to join <laughs> the, the uh, steering group. Well, um, that's probably because um, I have a long-standing relationship with the Faith and Belief Forum. You know, uh, we go way back, a whole decade back, in fact. So when I was, during my undergrad, um, I was part of the undergraduate parliamenters, 2010-2011 um, cohort. Ever since, I've been involved with the Faith and Belief Forum in some capacity or the other, you know, whether it's advisory or, you know, men mentoring um, newbies. That's kind of the sort of personal side of things. Uh, professionally speaking, I think, uh, you know, the concept of community cohesion, of co cohesive societies, fits really well with my own sort of research um, objectives, uh, you know, Tariq mentioned Islamophobia, so a lot of my research looks at Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, um, but also other forms of racial and religious um, hatred. And what I think is important is that we look at the ways in which societies, the ways in which communities actively engage with coming up with solutions to these challenges, to problems. And, um, you know, what about the agency of those individuals and communities involved? And I think often that's kind of missing from the conversation. And, and you know, to, to have something like social cohesion as, as a topic, firstly, you know, it, it's important to discuss faith, but also the ways in which faith is applied to these situations is also important, you know, to understand how people make sense of social cohesion but also what their faith means to them in the everyday life. Thanks, Mariam. Um, and I'm really glad that you brought up Parliamentals, which is the programme that we run to build leaders of the future from different faiths and beliefs. And, and it's brilliant to be sitting here 10 years later with you as, you know, someone working at the forefront of faith and belief in the UK. It's a testament to what our programme was trying to do. Okay, that's a really good grounding in how you got involved. I think the only thing I'd add from a faith and belief forum perspective is as um, kind of as the communities lead in our organisation, uh, a lot of the faith and belief based community projects I run are with local authorities or in particular parts of the UK, like working with statutory bodies on, on faith engagement. And I think what I see there at the grassroots level is that community cohesion has almost become quite a, a, a secular industry. You have a lot of people working in that sector that are very much generalists that, that focus on community cohesion and know a little bit about things like faith rather than uh, the funding or the infrastructure to have stuff that really have an expertise um, in faith and belief. So some of the ideas that Tarek was talking about in terms of um, uh, having a report that looked broadly at community cohesion, but the faith bit was missing, I was seeing in, in my grassroots work kind of playing out on the ground. And, and we saw the reason that we wanted this report to really focus on policy and practice was to kind of help to answer those questions at a uh, high level academia, rigorous level, but also to provide answers for grassroots practitioners, policymakers, uh, faith groups. Um, so yeah, that was really, really exciting to me to, to kind of blur that boundary. Moving on from that broad question um, to kind of focus in a bit more on the first half of the report which Maddie mentioned earlier which focuses around policy and policy developments in terms of social cohesion and faith over the last kind of 25 years so all through the new Labour years uh, looking at 9-11 and the subsequent securitization of community relations, austerity, Brexit, um, all big topics. Um, I was interested to know um, from the group if there was anything particular in that context that you wanted to draw out or particularly resonated with your own experiences or your own research or your own practice. 
I can kick off just as I think that one of the things if this also relates to what's just been said I think that actually I mean it's a bit strange for me to kick off being like what resonated in the thing you wrote <laughs> um, but <laughs> nonetheless and um, I think that this speaks to how complex and how um in its own category faith is in that people often collapse it into other groups and see it just as part of the community sector in general and Obviously, there are amazing things going on in the community sector. It's not to say that it's better or worse, but there are also different considerations, I think, around how how faith groups work versus other kinds of community groups. And I think um, I hope that, um, you know, this, along with other reports, can sort of help people see some of those complexities and, and, and treat faith groups not just as part of a wider sector, but as a, as a sector in their own right. I think um, the other thing I would say is that... Um, austerity has been massive in making that shift necessary. I think that often local authorities have been able to have a choice about whether to engage and when there is no money they don't have that choice anymore. Faith groups actually hold quite a lot of power in that sway and you know sort of power is a kind of you know it's not always a positive thing. Um, I'm not saying that it's great that they can kind of manipulate with that power but, it, but it, at least they, they demand being listened to and I think, um, you know, we've seen again and again in the places that we visit for a whole range of theos reports that, you know, it, it really is faith groups filling gaps that have just been completely decimated by um, a lack of funding elsewhere. So I, I think that that, that that has really changed the conversation, I think, um, and, and makes it ripe for a reevaluation. Um, I'm particularly interested, you know, in my work and everything in what we might call the politics, uh, especially the sort of national level politics, meaning not just policies, but also uh, the discursive frames involved in talking about the kinds of issues that we're talking about. And I mentioned earlier how, uh, as far as anti-racism and racial equality and the theories of multiculturalism were concerned, um, religion was a marginal topic and best thought best kept marginal. I think we, we saw a change with uh, Tony Blair and New Labour. Um, it wasn't always to the good, but I, I think it, Tony Blair really is a, a pivotal figure because, um, I mean, he, he's obviously a prime minister who was a um, a Christian believer in the way that probably other prime ministers haven't been for a long time. I mean, you know, the depth of belief and the centrality in which he put uh, religion, and I think especially with his family, with Sherry Blair and, and, and so on. And I think he began to take um, religious identity and religious communities more seriously and favorably uh, in the mid to late 1990s, you know, as, as leader of the Labour Party. And that actually flowed through into, into government. So one of the first things that, for instance, um, the new Labour government did through Jack Straw was that they uh, funded uh, Islamia Primary School um, that had been trying to get funding for many years, but had been continuously rejected by the, the major government and other conservative uh, administrations. And I think that the incorporation of the religion question into the 2001 census was really, if you look at the accounts, some of which are public, some of which are uh, private and anecdotal, really was just a personal decision by Tony Blair. The civil service was telling him there was no need the local government association was telling him, no, we don't need that question. And even the cabinet wasn't resolved on it. But uh, th through interfaith lobbying, Tony Blair finally said, yes, OK. And getting a question like that into the census, it really makes a very big difference to what research can be carried out, to uh, the statistics on disadvantage, on uh, discrimination, on growth in population and therefore questions about representation and so on. So it was really quite a pivotal, pivotal moment. And even though uh, a couple of years later, um, Alistair Campbell, the uh, press spokesman for Tony Blair famously said, we don't do God to some journalists who had asked him about something. Actually, uh, Tony Blair brought 
uh, faith and belief into the policy prism, um, not from zero, not from nothing, but to a much greater extent than was possible, uh, than was the case before. And it's more or less kind of stayed there since, since he brought it in. Now, obviously, as the report shows, the negative framing of faith communities around cohesion, especially after 9-11, and especially even more after the London bombings in 2005, um, not to mention, you know, uh, kind of riots and street confrontations in places like Bradford and so on. All that, I think, in many ways, uh, swept over the kind of agenda that Tony Blair was trying to develop, and we ended up in a different place to where some of us thought we were going in the early noughties. Um, and so the whole uh, policy agenda was a, a much more mixed and perhaps, you know, as we've all been saying, too negatively focused on faith communities as a problem rather than as a body of citizens whose concern and uh, philanthropy and convictions can make a positive difference to society. Just to add to what's already been said, when it comes to discussing religion in the public life, as is mentioned already, that it's always got some sort of negative connotations to the dialogue, to the discussion, to the discourse, as it were. You know, the narrative is very much framed around that. So, you know, sometimes, whether it's from our sort of um, interfaith background or approach or whether it's the academic discourse that we're involved and engaged with we often forget that policy isn't as forthcoming or welcoming to addressing issues surrounding faith with with a bit more of a diversity of opinions or you know with a positivity of sorts and that's something we as academics as practitioners need to kind of inculcate through the social impact work that we do it's to ensure that you know whether it's this report or whether it's any sort of work that we do um you know at the forefront of this sort of engagement it's that the message surrounding faith and what faith means to ordinary british people you know, is conveyed to policymakers and those who are in power in a way that, you know, it's not about saying, you know, we, we might say that, you know, faith's all, it's wonderful and it's great. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that we're saying this, it's not necessarily we're putting faith on a pedestal, but it's the fact that, you know, this is so important to so many people across the country. And it's not about not treating faith as a monolith in and of itself as well, but actually seeing, you know, there's so many diversities and so many nuances that are often forgotten should faith be put at the periphery of these conversations. So I think that's something, you know, that we try to do um, as social scientists, as practitioners, as people with multiple hats, as you probably will agree. The time period that we're living in right now, you know, we're all having this conversation over Zoom. So even more so, more than ever, faith is important in, in, in the era that we're living in, you know, post-COVID reality, inshallah, post-COVID, you know, <laughs> we're living in the midst of it right now and being very optimistic. But, you know, the role of faith in the public life is ever evolving and it's evolving even more rapidly given our current reality. So that's something, you know, that this report, hopefully using it, we can, we can illustrate that even more so than ever, we need to put forth faith at the forefront of our understanding of social engagement. Can I also just say on that, I don't keep the phone, but I also think it is worth just making the point that it's, it's sort of, evol I completely agree, it's also sort of evolving into the dark, as it were, because actually fewer and fewer, fewer, and fewer people actually have a faith identity. So the people who are making the policy are less likely just to intuitively understand these issues. So it's ever changing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people are atop these changes and are noticing them or even really understand the faith sector at all. Um, I was speaking to some friends about um, Jesus turning water into wine and they, they said, well, what's that? And I, I thought, well, this was just last week. And I thought, well, you just can't assume anymore that people know these things, which, you know, I mean, I was raised a Christian, but not everybody is of my generation even. So I think that that is going to be a challenge to communicate some of this even more so as we go on. 
I would agree with that. Um, so many of the points that you've raised have kind of really resonated with me as someone that works with faith communities on the on the ground a lot. I think that what your policy section did for me, Maddie, is sort of like put into context some of the the feelings that I feel like the faith groups that I work with have, or sometimes the confusion about government um, involvement. Often it might be that they've been involved in a faith forum that previously had a lot of support um, in previous governments through more of an infrastructure and more of a focus on faith and belief at like a local authority level and that that funding and that support might have been cut and then maybe if they were deemed to be a problem area or a risk area like 10 years down the line then it might have been reinstated but but none of that happens in in an overt way and it leaves communities thinking oh they used to be interested in us and then they weren't and now they are again and I don't know why and I'm a little bit suspicious and I'm not sure whether to get involved um so so it definitely made put kind of a lot of that into context for me the second part of the report um is very much focused on practice and it includes 12 really incredible examples of cohesion building projects that were inspired by faith or involved faith groups in different ways. I was interested to hear, are there, is there a particular case study or a particular example that stood out for each of you? Um, it could be from your own experience or one of the ones in the report. I think there was one that particularly spoke to me uh, and that's uh, case study four, the Minhaj al-Quran, the mosque in Newham, and the way that it has engaged with this amnesia that exists in this country about the role that what we now call the Commonwealth, what of course was the British Empire, beyond these islands, played in the, uh, the economic, the political and the military story of this country and of its, as it were, great power status. So Minaj al-Quran in 2017 held an exhibition on the role played by uh, Indian soldiers in the First World War. And it was a very large and substantial contribution, that uh, contribution to the First World War. Uh, uh, one and a half million uh, troops in the Indian army were mobilized and many of them fought in the Western Front. It wasn't like they were fighting somewhere far away. They were dying in the trenches of Flanders. And 80,000, roughly about 80,000 um, soldiers gave their lives, um, you know, defending uh, the British Empire, defending Britain uh, just across, across the channel. And I think that's such an important part of our history. And we've been so, we meaning, you know, Britain as a society, been so reluctant, so slow to go back and pick up that story. We still have some, you know, glory images of empire and so on. And of course now with the, you know, Black Lives Matter and decolonizing history moment, which is of course kicked off now in June and, June and July, 2020, um, we are beginning to rethink the role of slavery in the national story and the national prosperity. But I think more widely, we need to think of the, uh, the histories of all the peoples of the British Empire, especially those, you know, like my own family and Mariams and so on, who have ended up in Britain and are Brits, are British citizens and so on. And I think that's why I particularly like like that story and maybe i could just very briefly throw in two cases of my own which is slightly different they're not they're not 100 percent um faith and belief based examples but they just show you the the kind of the width that's possible in this area so one of them is actually about just an ordinary mainstream if you like secular local newspaper the leicester mercury I think over decades, this newspaper has played a very important community relations role in bringing ethnic minority, and which also means really minority religious communities, into 
the civic life of Leicester by reporting their stories, by having um, special uh, parts of the newspaper that are directly addressed to those communities, but always trying to integrate what's happening in the minority communities into the story of Leicester. I think it, it's, you know, its track record over decades is very good. And my other brief example is actually local here because I must wave some kind of flag for Bristol. Um, so this uh, um, example is a, a policy initiative called Building the Bridge. And it's actually part of the uh, infamous and if you like, not happily accepted uh, National Prevent Program. But the thing about the National Prevent Program, and the report recognizes this, is that it was uh, very differentially implemented across the country because it had to be implemented locally. The funding was national, but most of the work had to be done locally. And Bristol City Council, in its wisdom, went to the uh, Muslim community, and of course it will surprise no one that they went to the Muslim community as opposed to any other religious community, given that we're talking about prevent. They went to the Muslim community and said, look, we want to work with you on this, and we want to make this work what's best for Bristol. So let's form a committee together, not just relying on what the government or the Home Office says or whatever, but working on identifying local problems together and coming up with some solutions to them. And not only do we want uh, local mosque leaders and uh, local Muslims to be part of this committee, but we would like you to chair it. You know, obviously we'll, we'll uh, provide the secretariat and the resources and, and so on, but we'd like you, you to choose a chair. And then the local uh, Bristol uh, mosques uh, consortium they held elections and they you know the person who was uh, elected then became the chair of this committee this was some years ago because obviously the prevent funding died away and it was reorganized under a change of government and so on but i wanted to mention that as an example of a city council reaching out to a faith community which already felt quite stigmatized and under pressure and saying let's work together and look why don't you chair it why don't you set the agenda why don't you run it and we'll provide all the resources we would as if the mayor was chairing it so th those are three examples um you know of, of very good cases one in the report and two of my own instead of picking a case study i was going to say what really stood out for me was the bits where um, we talked about local authorities and their involvement in faith and belief. So there was um, the example of Camden Council, which in a bit of a similar way to Bristol, um, they had kind of said, look, we know faith and belief is really important in Camden and we want to take it seriously and do things a bit differently from the national agenda. I thought that was a great example. And then um, Maddie also kind of looked at an example of how another council, I think, was it Bolton? Bolton, yeah, I was gonna say Bolton. Yeah, um, how they were funding interfaith work in like a different and an innovative way. And I think like those kind of examples really spoke to me about what the practical impact of the report could be. Like, this is something that we can take round to different local authorities and look at the people that are really able to deliver faith and belief work um, on the ground in different locations and think about what practically we could do differently as a result of the findings. At the Faith and Belief Forum we've been working with Barking and Dagenham Council over the last two years and part of that we wrote a faith policy for the borough which was kind of the faith communities and the council co-wrote it together and we facilitated the process. That was a really interesting example of kind of locally led um, work that focused on the positive elements of social cohesion, something that we were thinking was missing. I know a similar-ish process has happened in Peterborough, which is probably the result of integration funding there, um, but I'd love to see more things happening like that across the country.
yeah, one of the great things about um, what happened in Bolton is so that they um, they fund a full time interfaith worker. They also give separate funding to various different, um, I suppose, intrafaith councils, all of which um, are great and doing their own great work. And um, they have a um, it's a council led consortium and um, Bolton 2030 vision. And um, that is essentially just the local authority led vision for the town. Um, it's not stop saying that it's council led, actually, because it is everyone's there equally at the table um but one thing that really struck me is that um the local churches um had taken it upon themselves to run a series of three um conferences so there were three aspects to the bolton vision which was basically being born well living well and aging well living well is just in the middle um and um, they'd done these three conferences to think about how best the churches could support this and they'd commissioned plaques that said we support the Bolton 2030 vision and put them up all around the town and had them sort of giving them to community partners and I just thought it was a really good example of what happens when you actually include faith groups at the table because they've completely taken on this vision as their own and put their own resources into making it happen um, so I think that was a really positive example for me I think that is touched on in the report um, I also think um, maybe we can mention the, the last case study, which is Gal Gale, uh, which is, a, is the only um, case study that doesn't have an official um, faith, at least, um, affiliation. But I think for me, it was quite important to include that because it shows, um, I suppose, what can happen when there is a um, general commitment to a vision of society. And, and I think that that is a, that the founders do actually have faith commitment, but it's not official in the, organization um, and it's sort of the the diamond which we all recognize at the heart of faith groups but is is sometimes harder tra to translate um, and seeing that in a different context and and I just thought it was a really moving example of of what can happen when um, people have a set of values that they want to enact um, and often that is what's happening with faith groups so um, it's um, Glasgow based and it's an old shipbuilding area but that industry has largely fallen apart um, and it's sort of deindustrialized now um, and this organization basically works with local people often recovering from addiction to to build ships with them in a traditional way so it's it's sort of embedded in the heritage of the local area um, but obviously moving on in a new in a new direction as well and dealing with a particular issue that that modern area is facing i just think that encapsulates so much about what what faith groups can offer faith and belief groups can offer um a social cohesion policy agenda i think it's wonderful that there's this um overarching theme um for all our favorite case studies um which is this idea of the local being at the very forefront of um of the discussion engagement of, of social cohesion. Uh, for me, I think obviously, I, much like Maddie, I, I really liked all of the case studies that you selected. They're so diverse and you know, they all pick on different aspects of what cohesion really means. But um, based on this theme of you know, belonging and, and on, on, on a local level, I felt case study number five, which was media cultured, really stood out to me personally because oftentimes what happens is we focus too much on major cities, firstly the, the London bubble, and then we focus on, you know, maybe we'd reach out to Birmingham or Manchester or, you know, communities where there is a diverse population, but it's it's a large population. But um, media culture stood out to me because um, it's a Middlesbrough-based social enterprise is, is what they what they call themselves, and I'm pretty much reading out because I, I don't want to get it wrong. So they produce a range of resources that challenge all sorts of stigmas and um, hatreds like racism, extremism, you know, uh, and they promote and foster this idea of unity and inclusion by engaging with the youth on a level that they, they understand. So it's about producing, you know, um, exhibitions and films and workshops, you know, really engaging with the youth, you know, it, it's good this sort of, the technology is ever, you know, rapidly changing. So last week it may have, well, not last week, rather a year or two ago, it may have been Instagram and Snapchat, but now all the kids are using TikTok. So, or, you know, stuff like that. So it's about speaking to, you know, the, as cliched as it might sound, 
the next generation is our future but it's about you know engaging with them on a level that they understand and value and, and they actually have fun with so i thought you know this stands out really well because um, you know, and, and, and then, you know, you spoke to people who are part of this, Maddie, and, and, you know, they, they seem to be very much not just local and far removed from, from those major city bubbles, but also the fact that they can, you know, have this engagement with a Muslim experience or Muslim experiences and then document them and narrativize them in a way that's accessible to you know the youth and, and in particularly the, which is particularly the audience that they're catering to um and i thought that you know that's such a wonderful way of promoting faith-based values and, and belief as well it's not necessarily as Matty rightly said it's not just about faith but you know when we talk about cohesion um we really need to understand that the element of identity and belonging shouldn't be left out of it and and um i thought you know of, of all the examples because i think the faith and belief forum itself was one of the case studies wasn't it so you know i, sh I should have taken that opportunity to say actually you know that that's, the that's best. my favorite case <laughs> but um no i i think i, sh I should rephrase rephrase that for, for the sake of our our um audience and our listeners because obviously after the faith and belief forum my next favorite is media cultured so thanks <laughs> i should also say on media cultured that the the person who i uh, interviewed as part of that um actually emailed me last week and said they've just been awarded the best is the best racism and extremism training provider 2020 which is really nice to hear faith groups having that kind of recognition i think it just yeah it's a real endorsement of what they're doing so Sounds like, yeah, we've got a lot of fans um, for, for lots of the case studies, but I guess what I take from what everyone said is that people love the projects that are particularly local and, and have a real local character to the Faith and Belief Project Delivering Social Cohesion, um, but also projects that are faith-led where people get to sit at the table and set their own agenda and ideally also with funding. We're going to move on to our last question, which um, looks to the future. Um, we've talked a little bit about a post-COVID world already, um, but what do you think we have to learn from the themes of this report in 2020? Well, firstly, I should say um, this flows from your last set of comments, uh, Tim. So you said the one thing that we all agree on is the importance of the local and so on. Well, actually, I'm not a localist. Um, I think, obviously, the local is important, but so is the national. And the situation that we are in at the moment is a very good uh, illustration of the importance of the national and the local. Now, I'll, I'll leave aside any question about the competence of our national leadership in this crisis but it's quite clear that we could never get through this crisis without some kind of national leadership national resources enormous amounts of national resources you know billions and billions of pounds um, national decision making and yet what we've seen flourishing across the country in this crisis is so much um, local solidarity and mutual aid. Some of it, of course, organized by faith communities and all faith communities. I, I see through my uh, Facebook timeline and Twitter feed and so on, how all faith communities are very actively working to help people in need, not just people of their own faith, you know, homeless, needy people, elderly people, um, you know, across, across the community. So we, so we, at the same time, we've experienced, I hope it'll last, I don't know whether it will, but we've experienced this certain kind of national mood of solidarity, perhaps just sentimental solidarity, but, but you know, sentiment's very important, we shouldn't lose it, you know, and um, people like uh, Vera Lynn being kind of iconic, in uh, crystallizing this for at least one generation or more than one generation 
of the country. But this kind of combination of national solidarity and local mutual aid, um, I think that's, it's such a good combination. Um, and I think that it is one of the things we can learn from in, uh, from uh, this report, but more widely about how to address issues of cohesion and the uh, contribution that faith communities can make to it. And related to that, I would say that one thing that um, the, the report mentions, but perhaps doesn't highlight, and in fact, nobody in the country really highlights this, we take it for granted, and that is the horizontal relations, the phrase the report uses, horizontal relations between different faith communities, is so good. I mean, imagine if we weren't talking about faith communities, but we were talking about political communities or political groups. I mean, we know how divided the country can be and was till COVID emerged about Brexit, for instance, and we might now be divided about how we handled COVID in the, in the next months ahead and so on. And I think it's, we, we so readily take for granted the good cooperative interfaith relations, the respectful relations that exist in this country, um, especially, I think, in at leadership level, but also uh, at a more grassroots level as well. And we only have to look at what's happening in some other countries, a country I'm particularly uh, concerned about, India. I mean, to realize how fragile those good relations can be in some context, because, you know, in some ways, India has been a model of diversity. But now we're seeing pogroms and um, on a scale that, you know, two or three years ago, no one would have expected. So I think that um, that horizontal relations is really important. And we should in some ways celebrate it. And because of my predilection for connecting the local to the national, we should raise it up to the national level. It should become part of our national self-image that we are a a multi-faith country which, in which faith is respected, no matter whether it's your faith community or someone else's. And of course, talking about faith and belief in general, this isn't restricted to uh, organized uh, religion or you know, theistic points of view uh, and so on. And given that we're now saying we need to rethink our history in relation to slavery and racism, and before I was saying, let's broaden that out to rethinking uh, our history in relation to empire and how this country became a multi-ethnic country. I would like to see faith communities also be a strand in the remaking of our national story. What I felt coming through as I was writing the report was that Actually, we are, particularly with Brexit, we are realising that, and have had to realise that cohesion issues just are bigger than those faith communities issues, which have often been the centre of the policy. So I think for me, um, moving beyond that, and Tarek mentioned how divided politically we are, that needs to be the focus, uh, you know, of the sort of cohesion um, problem solving. Faith groups obviously have a lot to offer in terms of the solution and on that point I would say um, perhaps um, slightly dodging the question that the other thing that, that obviously is said again and again in the report is that we shouldn't have cohesion policies which are um, written in response to crises that it needs to be a longer view than that so I think um, slightly dodging but no one really knows what's going to happen with Covid and actually we shouldn't really be making Covid the centre of our next that shouldn't be the next crisis that we then shape our next policy around right like we need to have a longer view in mind and so for me it is really about faith groups understanding what they have to offer to the solution and that that is a bit more evergreen than uh what's this latest, latest problem that we have to solve you mentioned brexit there maddie um i know the report kind of talks about state of post brexit as like a bit of an opportunity to like look at cohesion differently do you feel excited rather than nervous. There have been various moments, particularly around the Dominic Cummings incident, for example, where actually it has showed just how divided people still are. I mean, people's reactions to that hugely divided along the same lines that we've been seeing building up over the last few years. So I think 
Um, certainly, if it if being aware of the scale of the challenge is the same as being excited, then I can <laughs> call myself excited. <laughs> but um, I think it's a daunting task ahead, and that really means that people need to understand how important social cohesion is, apart from anything else. I think it goes back to what I said first of all that I, I don't think that people really see it as important. They see it as a particular niche policy area and actually social cohesion is about the strength of your community to respond to challenges together so it's actually the first thing we have to get right and um, not just a niche. I think reading the report and hopefully when our audience does read it they'll have this question in mind you know and why is cohesion important to me and I think something that is um, that can unite people of faith and belief backgrounds and those of none is this sort of commitment to social justice which is something we've seen quite a lot you know when it comes to the solidarity we see whether it's surrounding conversations um that the black lives matter um campaign and movement has shown us uh, whether it's conversations about you know as Tarek mentioned earlier slavery and decolonization there's this niggling feeling that you know having conversations with people of my generation and you know um it's that we want to see a better future. You believe in a, in a, in a socially just world in, in, a, in a way that, you know, that allows all of us to excel and thrive together. And this is this, this togetherness, the unity then comes from that. So this, I think what brings all of this together is this need, this innate need for a just world. And I think, you know, the future is very bright if we can remember and, you know, take a step back and remember why we're trying to achieve cohesion and why we're trying to aim for unity so i thought you know that, that's that's my two cents tim so that's a great two cents and um the mention of a brighter future is maybe um a good moment to draw things to a close there's been a huge amount of um incredible discussion on this podcast about um the history of social cohesion about um thoughts to the future um but particularly at every stage about where faith and belief really fits in and how faith and belief groups can be central to our cohesive vision of the future. This podcast was brought to you by the Faith and Belief Forum. You can find us at faithbeliefforum.org and on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.